everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, yeah, thanks for making the time to be here. I'm really delighted. Mm -hmm. It's a very special evening for us. It's our second edition of uh, Verse Solos, and I'm so proud and so pleased to have um, Harvey Reiner next to me, who's the artist we're exhibiting this evening. Mm -hmm. And Harvey's uh, flown in just last week. Mm -hmm from New York, um, so yeah, very pleased to have you. And I'm also joined by two incredible curators. Thank you so much for being here. I've got on um, my left, next to Harvey, Dr. Alfredo Cramerotti, um, who is a cultural entrepreneur, curator, writer, broadcaster, and publisher. Um, he's first and foremost also the director of the Moiston um, Institution, a contemporary art institution in Wales. And on my right, I've got Nico Epstein, uh, who is a curator, writer, art historian, and has curated exhibitions internationally, more than 20 um, exhibitions internationally, and has helped set up some art tech um, companies uh, such as uh, Artvisor <laughs> and Art Runner. So I'm really delighted to have you both here. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you. And I think I just, before we start getting into the conversation about Harvey's work, which is incredibly um, exciting, it's incredibly new way of looking at art, of collecting art, it's really a completely, yeah, for me it's been, I've never seen anything like it before, and before we get into that, I just want to give you an overview of what we're looking at in this exhibition space. So in the galleries you'll see uh, a number of uh, works by Harvey that he has created specifically for this exhibition. And um, except, I think we have three tiles in the exhibition. The yeah. rest are composites um, that, that Harvey has put together for the exhibition, which means that, and we're gonna get into the, we're gonna get into the definitions of what a composite is and what a tile is as we get our, our conversation going. But for those who are not familiar with Harvey's work, Harvey, is an artist who um, creates artworks with algorithms and codes. And, um, and what you're looking at is um, the tiles would be uh, randomly generated output by the algorithm. And the composites are combinations of these tiles. Um, and they are built in the composite builder. This sounds all very complicated, but we're going to get into it. Um, but, but the reason why I'm telling you this is that what you're looking at is not a, like a, it's not really a traditional exhibition where you're just looking at a final work of art. You're really looking at the potential that the algorithm can offer. These are sample outputs. Um, these are sample composites that, that, um, that Harvey has created for this exhibition. And, um, and I think that's what makes it so exciting. There is no final, there is no finality to it. It's really just the beginning, and, and at the core, it's about bringing people together. So thank you for being here. You're definitely part of making it. And I think just to kickstart the conversation, I'd like to ask from you, Harvey, uh, this project, this generative project uh, series is called Quasi Dragon Studies. Can you, in your own words, explain to us what it's about? <laughs> OK, am I, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Um, Actually, can, can I just ask a question? Yes. I'd, I'd just like to see if, uh, if uh, how many people would know what I mean by the word uh, Web3. OK, M most people. NFT. I just want to get a sense of who I'm talking to here. Um, OK. It's pretty solid. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay. You're safe. <laughs> <laughs> they're, 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 they're one of us. <laughs> right, right. So. Um, so I've always been like interested in this idea of co-creation where you know we we create a project where the the boundary between artist and collector where that boundary is blurred so um in web 3 a lot of collectors spend a lot of time um you know curating their own artwork collections um they, they call it pairing where they bring artworks together and uh, you know they change the color of the backgrounds and so forth. And I saw this project as like an, an extension of this idea of bringing two artworks together. So the basic idea is we have like as Layla says, we have these tiles, which are these random outputs, and they can be combined into these composites. But they uh, are combined in such a way that um, well, these tiles have these certain sort of joining properties. So 
the uh, sort of like the and just to interrupt you really company, quickly, what is a tile? A tile is just like, as it sounds, it's like a single rectangular output. Um, that, 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 that one there kind of looks like a single tile. It's actually got a blank on the right added to it, so we see a bit more of. of and it's that just, is, a, and that is. So when you're minting, when you're when you're going onto, you know, the the the, the website, and you're minting the work, mm. and the algorithm gives you a random output, that would be a tile. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that's defined as a tile. Yeah, and that's that's the thing that the collector buys. Right. And so if a collector has say three or four tiles, they can then go to the composite builder, and they can place these tiles together, in in different ways. They can add these things called blanks. And then they can then preview these these combined pieces together, um, and what that algorithm then merges the pieces together. So it's not like it just places the tiles next to each other; it kind of blends them together. So um, you know, they, they, even with just two or three tiles, the collector has quite a lot of creative freedom to to, to try and make something more beautiful. So the composite builder is like, um, it's, it's a tool that you've created mm -hmm. and that allows the collector to take the output, the tile that they've generated, put it into the composite builder. Mm. And then kind of they have this, this, you're giving them in a way a freedom of creating their own compositions if, if they want to. Right. Or they have the option to keep the tile as it is. Correct. Yeah. So if they dislike the tile as it is, yeah, yeah. they can they can still convert that into an NFT mm -hmm. using the composite builder without adding anything to it, or maybe just adding a, a blank. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah. How are how are blanks? Sorry, blanks distributed and used in the project. So blanks are just free for anybody to use. They're they're not a tile as such. They're like a spacer. So every tile actually, it, it kind of enables the tile to grow into a space. So if we look at that blue one there, the that kind of fan structure to the right, that wouldn't be, the tile would actually just be the left side. But if you add a blank, it enables it to kind of grow into the space and, yeah. So essentially, um, collectors are kind of putting them together like creative puzzle pieces. And you're giving them right. full creative freedom to do that, right? Right, so th there's, there's two, shall I talk about the two different ways we can approach yeah. it? So. So yeah, there's two distinct ways we can, like the collectors can approach the product, the, the, the project. So they can either just try to make the most beautiful kind of composite they can, um, or they can actually follow these very sort of strict joining rules um, to make these very sort of rare composites, which are just technically difficult to make. It's more like solving a puzzle where you have to find all the right puzzle pieces and buy them from, from the secondary market. So um, and then once they're combined in a very specific way, they then unlock this thing called a black dragon. And there's 108 of these in, in the collection, which can, you know, there the can never be any more than that. And so the people who do that are, are trying to, they're playing, a, they're kind of like treating it like a, a game where they're trying to find something that's very rare, statistically rare. And there's, um, you could say there's maybe a slight kind of artistic trade-off to that. Every one of these, these, these composites that have been built with these strict joining rules are turned into this dark palette. Um, but they potentially are going to end up with something that's valued quite high because it's so statistically rare. And in, in, in Web3, you know, that's, that's, that's just a big feature of Web3 that, that you know, people buy artworks which have metrics, we call them traits, features, or properties, um, which kind of like determine how statistically rare these outputs are. So um, so they can play it that way, they can go after the black dragons, or they can just make beautiful art, hopefully. Um, and, and you said in, in your, I think it was in your Medium article, like it's interesting for you to see it says almost like an in, in like an experiment. What, what right. will collectors go for? Like right. explain in your own words what you said about that. Right, yeah, so there's a lot of parts of this project which are an experiment and we don't know how it's going to pan out, but yeah, it's like, what do we care most about as a community? Do we care about statistical rarity or do we care about making art? I mean, actually, if you ask, if you survey the community, a lot of people will say, oh, no, we love the art <laughs> more than anything. We do but, love the rarity but, too. But we also love the rarity because it's, you know, typically that's how we... Ideally, we want both. 
Yeah, um, one speaking of which, <laughs> there's two black dragons. So one is on the wall just behind like the one I'm facing right now. And then there's another one on the left hand side. So just for you to get an idea about the black dragons. I'm going to um, come back again um, to the mechanics. But part of me feels like talking about it and writing about it is actually one part of it, but you, your composite builder is actually very in, intuitive. So once you start using it as a user, everything kind of comes together. And I think um, we, we have an iPad kicking around here somewhere where we have um, Harvey's test site um, out if anybody wants to have a go at creating these composites. The, the sale doesn't open until the 22nd of August, but you can kind of start playing around a little bit of how you, know, you could compose different kind of pieces together. I'm interested to hear though, Alfredo, from your point of view, this is like we're looking at a very interesting art project here. And um, as I said earlier, like there is no final piece of artwork. It's very much about the process. It's very much about including a community. It very much depends on the community. So we actually don't know how it's all gonna pan out. We're, um, you know, are positive, but you just don't know. As, um, as a director of an institution, how do you display, like, what are, like, how do you display an artwork like that that doesn't just go straight on the wall? And, yeah, how, how does that work? Well, I think, to some extent, this is kind of a museum dream because it depends really on the audience to make it happen. Um, and that's what every kind of our cultural institution strives for, especially actually to target this kind of a younger demographic, so that kind of thing. It involves an element of gamification as well that is important in this thing. You know, you mentioned the, the jigsaw, the puzzle mm -hmm. element, which is, I think is, is good. So in a way, it's, there's no one fixed recipe here to show this work. I mean, you chose here to show basic exhibition copies. Mm. to yeah. give an impression yes. of what it looked like when... In quite monumental scale. In quite scale. monumental scale, <laughs> which, you know, it could be one route to go, yeah. uh, institutional-wise, or you can just go uh, online and digital and just make the whole platform available mm -hmm. for museum audiences to, to go through it. I must say, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit complicated mm. in, from, from an audience, from a general audience point of view, there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of uh, get your... Know, hand around it and mm -hmm. your head around it to but you know I tried earlier to compose it which I thought it was really cool um, because when I read it the things until you try actually you don't right? really figure it out it's quite once intuitive once you use it yes once you use it it's also troubled me because um, as a curator I don't collect for an ethical stance. So yes. I just, you know, kind of, a, I curate, I select, I advise, I don't And you collect. get gifted, let's be honest. I, I was a curator gift. for long years, <laughs> <laughs> many years. And, but I don't collect because I need to keep that kind of a mental distance. Um, but in this case, you know, in order, when you select things and then you put it together, you know, you have to buy to get it. <laughs> because otherwise you don't get it. Right. Which, you know, has kind of put me in, in the spot. Like, what, what do they do, actually? <laughs> do I let it go or do I actually buy it and get it? Um, but it's, it's an interesting element to think about from uh, in, the, in the jargon, the museum jargon is the audience engagement and, uh, and outreach. I think it's, this is one of, the, of those projects who actually could make the difference uh, in terms of audience outreach because it can play on so many levels. You do have the collector's level, you have the Web3 community level, you have the yeah. uh, gaming level, you also have actually the you know, family and, uh, and, uh, and kind of a very general access to an idea of art, which is not necessarily actually playing mm -hmm. hard in terms of the knowledge you have to have and the background and the education you have to have. You can actually get it and go through it mm -hmm. and build it on your own, basis on your own intuition, your visual inputs. And I think it's a very, very interesting element. I don't know if that was, was your intention, probably not, but it's a process, you know. Right. You, you, you started to work with codes and algorithms, you build these things, and then I do, I am a believer that once an artist puts an artwork in the world, you essentially lose control of the artwork. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the, 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 you know, the interpretation of the artwork, the yeah. significance of the artwork, it's, it's not on the artist anymore. Mm -hmm it's on the who will receive the artwork in space and time unless um, you unless you discredit the work as the artist 
which then gets into a whole other sort of Absolutely. thorny case of copyright. We're <laughs> not gonna, that's beyond the scope of this we, conversation. We're going to get into that okay. as well. We're going to get into that as well. But I, I think what you were just saying is really interesting. And I think what Harvey's doing with this, with this particular project is that he's kind of turning everything around. Usually an exhibition is, as an audience, you can be quite passive. And you are actually saying, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. You've got to interact and you've got to make, you know, bring it together. I'm interested to hear from you, though, um, Nico, because like, we're talking about how we're creating these different um, composites. Um, there's a lot of technical um, language going, kicking around. We have to do a lot of explanation. And you are somebody, you're a curator who comes from a fairly traditional art world. Um, you've Yes? Right. Yes? Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. like, how do you onboard, like, how do we, because this is a challenge a I question. have as well, how do we onboard people who are not from Web3, who are who don't know anything about tiles or outputs, or, like, how do we make this as exciting as we are currently finding it? Well, I think, from my perspective, I work in the fine art world um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but I have a deep passion for digital art, for NFTs, and that's part of, part of what makes this entire project and this experience so interesting, the, the sort of endless variability in the step-by-step -step process that was described by, by Harvey and Alfredo. So uh, for me, personally, having a, a master's degree in art history and studying art history my whole life, I usually look for certain touch points. I look for points of interest in the canon, in the vernacular of, of physical fine art. And I use those points as, of reference to start to better understand what's going on. And I think a lot of people who are looking at digital art dismiss it as being a scam, as being a Ponzi. They don't actually understand how projects like this interact with the traditional fine art world in such a meaningful way. And with this, with this uh, drop in particular, for me, I was really reminded of Fluxus, as an example, the idea of community building, the idea of everyone being an artist, the idea of moving art into life. But unlike a, a Fluxus performance, which usually has a predetermined set of parameters in a predetermined time, this particular project extends beyond the temporal, beyond the physical, beyond the digital. It sort of has different permutations, which make it so complex and, uh, and to me, so interesting. And the other point of reference that I like to think about when I was looking at these works and discovering Harvey's practice and, and everything that he's been doing is Japanese woodblock prints. If you look at the, the motifs, there's definitely uh, an oriental uh, complexion, pattern, stylization that you can see on the works. But Yukioi, for example, Japanese prints were also a collaborative process. You had the person who did the drawing, the person who did the carving, you had the publisher, so it was multiple hands that were going through the process of making the work, distributing the work, and it was accessible by the general public because they were usually printed on pieces of paper that the Japanese uh, individuals could buy. And then that also had a big impact, of course, on the work of Van Gogh and the work of post-impressionism and other European artists who were looking at those Japanese prints. Mm -hmm. And I hope that this project will also have more extended influence than just what we're discussing. So for me, to go back to your initial question, it really is about framing the work in the context of fine art and uh, in, in, in the context of, fine, of, of um, sorry, art history, but also understanding that it can go beyond that. And that's, that's part of what makes being here so enjoyable. Brilliant. I, 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 yeah, that's a really nice correlation between the printmaking and the Japanese uh, woodblock printing. Yukioi, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I mean, you just brought this up. And of course, you know, the aesthetics of the, the Eastern aesthetics, the Japanese influence, the influence of Buddhism in your life um, is something that we can see in the series um, in Quasi Dragon Studies. And I, I have another question here where, well, tell us more about the aesthetic influences that Quasi Dragon Studies has. We, saw, we spoke about the mechanics, but can you tell us more about the aesthetics um, that Nico just touched upon and yeah, how it relates to your personal life? Because your personal life is incredibly interesting and it's I've never done this before, and as a curator, you're not really supposed to do that, and I'm going to get back asking you questions about that. But it's, it's gone into my text panel because I find it so interesting. So, yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about it? The, 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 the life? Or the, the <laughs> <laughs> tell us more about the influence of the, the, the aesthetic um, okay. influences of quasi-dragon um, studies. Yeah. Let's start it's there. Which is Buddhism. 
Uh, and where the influences I'll, I'll of Buddhism came from. I'll wind it back to, the, to where I began with geometry and yeah. then how that feeds into maybe Buddhism. So, yeah, so I th when I went to art school, in, you know, when I was 20, 19 years old, uh, I'd already sort of explored a lot of different sort of visual languages. I'd, I'd copied a lot of different artists and I kind of was overwhelmed and felt like, well, there's so much art we could make. It's so hard to make an ori one original mark with a paintbrush because so much has already been done. And there was a sense that kind of like painting was dead maybe. And I really loved painting. That was what I wanted to do. I wanted to make two-dimensional images anyway. And, and your paintings are beautiful as well. The, oh, the, the physical thanks. art that thanks. you made in the 1990s, I think a lot of people don't realize that you also have right. that inflection, that touch as an actual painter, which lends itself so well to the digital work. So I think that's worth mentioning too. Right. So um, thank you. Uh, so to me, it's like, how do I make something original? And that's always been really important to me. Like, so I started to think about geometry. Uh, well, I started to think about music, like how do we take like, the abstract world of sound and, and turn that into music? And it's through things like you know, scale, tempo, meter, this very sort of precise structure. And there's this thing in sort of like the creative process where I feel like we have, like, it's kind of counterintuitive, but we have to kind of like limit ourselves in order to be able to say anything meaningful. So um, in the same way, like a piano only makes certain sounds, right? It doesn't just make any, abs you know, any sound. It makes a very specific range of sounds in a very structured way, and we can express ourselves through that. So I thought, well, geometry is this natural way to do this in a two-dimensional space. So I start over the years, I try to find an equivalent to the structures in music using geometry. So I've done that for about 15 years. and. How this ties in, I guess, to Buddhism, uh, I became very influenced with Zen Buddhism. And I, I practiced a, a, a lot. <laughs> it became a big part of my life. And I became very interested in sort of Zen, Zen art, Zen painting. And in that sort of like tradition, it's often very direct mark making. Sometimes the painting is just one mark. It comes from the gut. It's very instantaneous. And you would think, well, how do you get from that to geometry? <laughs> well. You know, I would meditate on these kind of geometric systems so that I would have these kind of intuitions about, okay, I'd, I would sort of find these, these relationships in the geometry which felt like they came from the same place, very direct. So I would make these outputs which, you know, they were very s simple to build. I, I, I wouldn't fuss with them. I could, there was no actually arbitrary kind of elements in there. They were all part of this geometric system. So to me, it felt like a, a, like a modern equivalent of this Zen art, which I loved. Um, but then over the years, that slowly kind of like grew in complexity. It no longer looked like Zen art because it was so, although it was black and white, but it looked very kind of complex. It kind of looked, complexity grew sort of exponentially over the years. And that's when I started to use a computer. Now, um, and we leap, like go, and I've done that for about 15 years. And then I started to make generative art for about 10 years, uh, which took quite a different direction. Um, and then this project is the first time I've actually brought that kind of whole body of work, that, that geometric meter system I developed over the 15 years into generative art. And technically it was really difficult, <laughs> like just to kind of like, um, to build these, these forms in a, in a generative algorithm, which tends to be a lot more, lends itself more to like organic outputs. Um, to do it in a very kind of constrained way like this was just technically, well, it was just very difficult for me, but anyway, we got there. But it, it just straight away lent itself to this possibility of, okay, these things look like they join together. Well, they do. Mm -hmm. So the, the kind of whole project just grew out of that system of geometric mm -hmm. meter. Um, it just, uh, and I, you know, like you said, I, I didn't know how it was going to go, but it was through doing other generative projects and getting familiar with community uh, like how the community works, that, that kind of just, you know, um, it felt like it grew, the project grew out of a kind of like a conversation I, I had on Discord and Twitter with the community. The mm -hmm. ideas they gave me, I do always share everything I do. Um, I'm, I'm not answering your question at all here. I'm rambling, no. but like, no, <laughs> I was just going to get back to my question here. Um, no, I think I think it's interesting because whenever I ask you about your work, that's the first thing you go back to to the geometry. And as a curator, I do the wrong thing. This is why curators are a bad thing in this world. Is that I kind of make my own connections because for me, the series came together when I heard about your life story, 
where you, you know, you grew up not very dyslexic. You didn't read until the age of 18, left, universe, uh, left school, became like obsessed with philosophy and Nietzsche and Dostoevsky. And, and, and sort of found your place in a very frustrated place um, where you kind of disassociated yourself from society. And it's interesting, like you don't bring those things up until I sort of really did that. <laughs> but for me, that's very interesting because that's how the series comes together. And, and during that time, you've, you got almost frustrated with yourself because you didn't like who you became and, and you got heavily um, you know, into Buddhism and you meditated for four to five hours a day. And, um, and it was a very pivotal time for you where you decided to become homeless essentially for six months and, and get rid of all your belongings. And for me, this series is a direct, like there's a direct relationship between that philosophy of life because in a way you're giving up as an artist your whole mm. ego. By I'm like, I'm giving away my ego. I'm not the ultimate creator. I'm giving it to my collectors. So I see that like spirit um, that you that was so influential in your work in, 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 in you. And I want to hear from Alfredo and mm. Nico, how much do we need to detach? How important is the personal story and the bio biography of an artist? Um, how much do we need to detach it from in the traditional world? You're supposed to really not think about the, the biography. In Web3, this is interesting because you're supposed to be more an anonymous. So I want to hear from both of you. Supposedly. What yeah. do we do? <laughs> what do we do? But How think, important yeah. is the story to sell the work? But personality also in Web3 comes through it. And, For sure. uh, more and more, actually. The, the more actually your work circulate, the more you become visible to your community, the more people find out who you are and who you want to be and I think it's an interesting sort of a dialectic there. It's probably a tension. Mm -hmm. I think between wanted to be anonymous and wanted to um, have a voice uh, based on who you are. I, I think, you know, going back to your story, I, I, there is an interesting tension here between, you know, kind of a wanted to give up, give up control but also finding a structure at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because in your life you 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 went to look for that structure that you didn't have it, mm -hmm. being that the Zen and the geometry or the algorithm mm. in that case, and you tr you know you move from one to the other, and you probably move to another okay. something else in the future. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you don't want actually to be prescriptive about mm. that. Mm -hmm. So you want actually to, to the, your your community, your collectors, your curators, friends, family, well, you, they want, you, you want them to be part of it. Mm -hmm. I think there is already kind of an interesting tension there, yeah. probably. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think a lot of people in the art world sort of selectively pick and choose when it comes to biography. Completely. And so, yes, in art history class, you're taught not to conflate the artist's life with their work. But I think in Web3, as an example, where the artists are so heavily engaged in the repetitive commenting on their own practice, um, which is different than more, let's say, traditional conventional artists, then the biography becomes an integral part of what's being made. And the fact that you're describing your, your life as it relates to discord and, and receiving the community um, and their intonations means that your initial involvement with them and your life online becomes inseparable from the final output of, of what's being created. and. I think, again, I have to go back to another uh, Fluxus example, but if anybody here is familiar with John Cage, John Cage was also um, a very strong adherent to Zen Buddhism, and that led to the creation of monumental works like 433, oh, wow. where... Best work ever in history. Right. Claim. Okay. <laughs> but... Um, Hands down it is. <laughs> it, it ended up being the case that John Cage, with that work, gave the, uh, the power of authorship and the power of participation to the audience. The audience became the music, became the composition, became the work in the same way that we become part of the work when we're assembling tiles, when we're joining the images on the composite builder, when, when we're using blanks. And the fact that he was an adherent to Zen Buddhism and practiced that, and also the fact that he collected um, mushrooms that had all these other quirks and was a teacher, those, those parts of his personal biography segued and permeated into his practice. 
and he was known for those things as well as his art. So I think even though we're told not to separate, we're told uh, uh, to separate the life of the artist from the work, yeah. they oftentimes manifest and cross-pollinate in ways that are uh, wonderful to see. And this, is, this exhibition is a case in point of that. Yeah, exactly. Great. Um, I actually don't want to keep everyone for very long, but I have a... I want to sign off the, the, this chat with a very interesting thing you brought up the other day, Harvey, we spoke about um, a few days ago. And you said that um, what you would like to do with this series of work is that once um, everybody, um, you know, anybody who um, basically mints their tile or their composite, you're giving them full copyrights um, to the owner uh, of the work. Mm -hmm. and. I want to ask you more about that. Why, why did you decide to do that? And um, yeah, more, more on that. Um, yeah, it's just like a, a, a continuation of that. I mean, it just seems the right thing to do. Um, I, I actually just think it makes perfect sense. You know, you think about the, the Mona Lisa, right? The more postcards, tea towels, and things there are in existence with the Mona Lisa face on, the, the more the Mona Lisa is worth, the, the more sort of like special that becomes, right? So it's a... It's just an extension of that, that idea. Um, and with this project in particular, I mean, I think a lot of people in Web3 don't realize that they don't own the intellectual property of a piece, but we want to, you know, explicitly state that and encourage people to go away and do what, make a shirt from your... I mean, you can't just... You can't make a, a T-shirt out of any token. You can only make it out of the, the composite you own, but you can do what you want with it. And I, I think it's going to be... It's just... I just see that as the future of this space. I think we'll see more and more projects do that. Mm. I, I mean, it, it's interesting because, you know, I've, I've also worked for so long in isolation, being very precious about my work, mm -hmm. and nobody saw it. <laughs> yeah. So this is like I've completely swung the opposite direction, and as an artist, I actually wanted to, you know, one of the things I want to do next year is start to document my life on film, mm -hmm. well, my practice, you know, mm -hmm. invite every couple of weeks have somebody come to my studio and film me getting angry. <laughs> yeah. So I, follow me in the whole process. And, and um, what, so that. What yeah. would you do with that? <laughs> I would put it on YouTube and just uh, watch, let people watch it. <laughs> but, um, I'm, but just, this, I'm just thinking right. about Erki I'll turn it into an NFT. Just about yeah. <laughs> the, the life of Erki Kuranyemi. Right. The Finnish composer and artist. Right. He died actually a few years ago. Oh and dear, that Harvey don't do it. No, no, no. Well, you know, it I mean, was, I mean, you know, he had a certain <laughs> age, but he obsessively documented his life right. in, uh, in film and video and photography since, you know, the 50s or whatever. Mm. And, um, and it was part of his practice, really. He was composing music, he was doing kind of a Electro visual composition, mm. kind mm. of a super experimental stuff, mm. and I'm not quite sure what happened with all the documentation of life because it was really kind of a every day, not just every couple of weeks. Okay. It was like yeah. mm. I haven't digged into that. But isn't that what we're doing today? I mean, I yeah. find that people you know, are mm. extremely over communicative over every single thing that they're doing right yeah. now. So aren't yeah. we, in a way, documenting a version of what we are every day anyway? Sure, yeah, for sure. But he's wanted to do it with a purpose, though. Yes. And that was, I was investigating yeah. the purpose. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but what's interesting also about the copyright is that with these works, with these composites, it's pretty insane because you can print them at the sizes that you're looking at. And that's like, it's a gift, big thing to give away because, Nico, am I right to think that in the, in the traditional art world, um, and I threw a lot of people off with that traditional art thing, but isn't that true that really ultimately the rights of the artist are always, uh, sorry, the rights of the art, artwork are always with the artist ultimately. So how does that, how does that work and will this change things in the, in well, the contemporary art if, field? If you believe in the utopian potential of hard-coded smart contracts in the Web3 space, then logic has it that the artists or the publishers can then actually bake in the royalty and the copyright contingent and, and these types of attributes to the work itself, which is, for me, one of the reasons that I find the space so interesting because of the control that these different parties have, how they operate together, and how it's manifested in, in, in digital code. So typically, my understanding, 
not a copyright lawyer would be that the artist usually has the ultimate copyright mm -hmm. to their work uh, in terms of the, the reproduction and the other sort of uh, things that the images can be used by. And oftentimes that's used with, and that's oftentimes baked within the, the contract or the invoice when the work is sold, uh, that the artist maintains that. But in this case, if it was Harvey's volition to y allow other people to maintain copyright, then that would be his ultimate call. And mm -hmm. that's something that I think is really interesting. And then that segues nicely into another question that I was going to ask you, which is if individuals were interested in having the physical copy of the work, would could they do it? Could they do it? And would you sign it? And then what happens to the copyright after that physical work is printed? Uh, so they will be able to download a high res file from the composite builder. Um, maybe, maybe they could. Yeah, they could print it this size. But I mean, um, there's a limit on how high res I can supply that. You know, um, would I sign it? Um, <laughs> just I like I, I would if I could logistically do it, you know. Like it just turns into like I, I'm careful about what I promise because logistically, yeah. if I end up with twenty, you know, like hundred people saying, "Okay, you promised me a sign print." I mean, how do I go? How do I do that? I don't know. Because so, they could generate more than one. Print. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So <laughs> I'm, I'm. I mean, we're being filmed, so I'm going to just be careful about what I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but um. In theory, you know, if I, if 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 they if they brought you know if they sent it to me, I'd be happy to sign it with a return label. You know, um, I have two other yeah. I have two other questions about the physical permutation yeah. of the work. Do you have any specifications for the quality of the print? The no. pro okay. Third question: If somebody buys the NFT, prints the work, mm. and then they sell the physical work, but they don't sell the NFT, how would you feel about that? It's fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's no constraints whatsoever. But doesn't that then sort can of make create a, a schism in the value of the digital token and the actual physical product, which then have a separate life outside of what you originally intended? I, I'm, I'm re with this project, I really am just willing to, to see what happens. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to control it. I, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, the whole thing with generative art is that you have this randomness, mm -hmm. right? There's a part of that which is just giving up control yeah. But mm -hmm. there's also, and the way of thinking about it more, is this a way, is it like a way of exploring a range of possibilities? It's a really powerful tool. Mm -hmm. So you design your algorithm, which does, you know, has certain parameters, and you throw randomness in there, and that's, that's the way you explore what's possible. So I see this as the same thing in this space, right? I just throw the stuff out there, and it's a way of exploring the community, exploring the space of conceivable art. Yeah. There is a parallel, because in the Composite builder, you you integrated the blank spaces, mm. which is also is like a sort of a random right. element yeah. that you can expand that part of the picture or the other part of the picture, but you don't really know what's mm -hmm. going to happen in the right. end. Right. Right. Mm. Actually, at this point, if anybody has any questions for Harvey, please feel free to ask them. Yes. Yeah, my question is, um, do, do you envisage being able to um, compile in real time? So in other words, if you curate an exhibition, would you be able to have people actually um, compiling tiles in real time in an exhibition? I mean, that would be great. I mean, especially if we could do that here. That's a great idea. I mean, a great idea. Is that idea for, <laughs> is that idea for <laughs> most of is, is that? <laughs> oh, I think you just found yourself an exhibition. Um, I mean, that sounds great, you know. Yeah, I mean, why not? Um, if if technically that was, I mean, it would I, it would be technically possible for sure. Yeah, um, it's you know the in real life. Uh, it's so stupid calling it that, right? But yeah, in Web three, we say in real life, yeah. which no, you, it just uh, means normal. IRL. Yeah, yeah, IRL. <laughs> it, but it's just, uh, but it's just, <laughs> just say it's just life. <laughs> it really go right. Yeah, um, I'm I'm really interested in you know. Uh, I really like meeting people. I mean, I do a lot of my work on Discord and so forth, but any excuse to have a show like this where I can meet people, that's, uh, that's great. You know, I definitely want to do that. Great. Ooh, yes, Dean, sorry. Um, yeah, just a quick question on the tiles that are composites. Um, if I have, say I have two tiles and I create a composite on them, if I was to sell those two tiles, Is there an element of randomness in the composite that's 
Right, so, yeah, something I haven't explained. When you combine two tiles together and make a composite, those two tiles are what we call burn. They're, they're just, they're, they no longer exist, so they can't be handed off to somebody else. To, yeah, so, and like I say, if you just like, really like those two tiles, you can also convert them into two, two NFTs, just as they are, so. Well, when they become the composite, hmm. you don't necessarily have Oh, do you okay. have to mint it? Oh, so in the composite build, you just preview. You can you can yeah. keep previewing over and over again oh, until you find something that you like. You can save the composites that you you know you like, and then uh, you know after a certain period, you can look at. No, oh, I like this one, and I'm going to mint that one. It's actually difficult not to like it because it, it comes out really really gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever combination and you it's choose. Different. You put the tiles together, but then until you click preview, you yeah. don't. You don't really they, realize they how they combine. And it's yes. like wow. You had another question there. Yes. Yes. One, are we going to be able to pull with this ahead of the mint? Yes. Yes, so yes. in another, another, another yes. week. Yes, yeah. just and, stay and, tuned. And it's all going to happen. The, can, we, can, we, <laughs> can we say when? Uh, we can say when, yes, we can say when. Um, probably in a couple of weeks from now, no later than a couple of weeks from now. Or tonight. Or on tonight. The iPad. Or tonight <laughs> or on the right. iPad, you can have a play. No, no, I can't wait. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. A personal question. So. How is it that in your whole exploration and squatting and such, you met your wife? Ooh. Oh, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> She's over there, by the way. Um, yeah, how are yeah. So, <laughs> I, I'm going to keep this quick because it's going to go on. So, um, you know, so as Leila described, I, I, I ended this period where I kind of got really deeply into a meditation practice and that, you know, where I was meditating for a lot, you know, three, four, five hours daily. And that went on for about th two years, and, and that kind of culminated where I, I, I decided I was going to go and live in a, in a monastery in Rochester. Well, not a monastery, but a Zen center in, in Rochester. And so I sold everything. I flew to Rochester. I hitchhiked there. It took a couple of weeks. And uh, I got there, and actually it wasn't what I thought it was. I, kinda, I had all these ideals about what it was to practice Zen, and they, they gave me this leaflet that said I had to pay 60 bucks to do a workshop, and I said, no. I don't, I don't have nothing, nothing to do with you guys. So, but then I continued that life. I just hitchhiked around America, living, you know, just continuing to, to meditate under bridges or sleeping on the streets and eating food out of trash cans and like, like just like a bum, you know. And um, and I did that for six months. But at the end of that trip, um, I, I I actually felt like okay, I've I've done what I what I intended to do. I really want. I feel like I need to anchor myself, and because I really wanted to make art again. It was the only period in my life where I haven't made art, you know. So, um, but at that time, I, I I got picked up by a guy, and and he. I ended up living with him for three months. But the day after I met him, he introduced me to my wife, and um, yeah. Lucky and man. then so then you know we got together and we we, we had a family within a year. Um, she she had already had a small kid, so I went from that life. Being married with two kids in a few months, uh, you know. Talking great. about structure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the structure, so right? <laughs> I asked for structure. Control. That's what I got. Yeah, but that was great. You know, it was. Um, no regret. We've been married twenty-five years, so it's all worked out. Lucky man. <laughs> You've got a question. Oh. oh, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's another phenomenon in Web3 where if you, so a collector could invite another artist to build the composite for them, right? If they have a collection of tiles or they want to, you know, that the artist could choose the tiles to, for that collector to buy. Yeah, that would be, I mean, that's just an awesome way to promote the project if you can get a, a well known artist to do that. It's yeah. interesting you don't have any problem with it. Because oh. Right. You know, in terms of like when it comes to the market. Right. It's interesting that yeah, I never thought of it as being a problem. It's I'm I think not it's yeah. a problem. Right, right. Yeah. Um it's something maybe again that's unique to, to this web three space is that that's that's actually quite
common, you know, with the Q QQL project. Uh, it's a way of kind of like cross promoting, mm -hmm. right? So if we get this artist over here who has, you know, 10,000 followers on Twitter, he makes the piece and that helps to promote the project. So it's, uh, no, I, I would be fully, fully up for that. I, I would actually go out there and try to ask artists, you know, like, yeah, I would probably have a reservoir of tools, uh, not to tiles, and go out and say, can you make a composite for the project and you can keep it, you know, something like that. Yeah. Thank you, Karina. I think we have time for one more question, if anybody has. Yes? Uh, oh, mm -hmm. now I, I can't. Both of you are going to have to ask. <laughs> you, okay. No, and you, you, you and you, both of you. <laughs> yes, go on. Yes. Um, I'm curious how you choose the parameter space for this piece. Yeah. How would you, sorry? So when you're working on the sort of tuning of the parameter space yeah. for this piece, obviously when you did like Fontana, and I'm putting words in your mouth, so right. you tell me if this is entirely wrong. Right, um, right. You, you know, it felt like every single piece of Fontana was just beautiful and individually very unique. Right. The piece was very tuned to that. With this, though, you're building this sort of system of interaction. I'm just curious, like, how was that different? And how did you tune it? Are you, are you tuned it mm. more for right. entropy, so people can find interesting combinations? Or is every single one Mm -hmm. you know, much more designed to be kind of beautiful on its own. I, yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's definitely a different type of algorithm. With this project, it's this finding a balance where you give enough creative freedom to the collector that they really do feel like they're part of the process. Well, they are part of the process, but also you want to be able to make every possible permutation decent. So you've got to lock it down more than maybe Fontana. Um, um, but the, the, it's also built in just a very different way. It's just, just inherently locked down geometrically. So um, I kind of like the way I, I, but just developing the algorithm, it's getting a little technical, but um, yeah, 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 well, <laughs> <I'm>, so <laughs> Um, it felt like this is a similar process. At the end of the day, you're looking, you know, you're writing some code, looking at something here, yeah. and you're trying to just look at it with an open mind and think, what does this need? Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what is this image crying out for? Or what's really mm -hmm. offensive? <laughs> you know, it's the same when you paint a picture. Yeah, you need to step away from Maybe, it. Yeah, I, well, it, it's the same fundamental challenge of painting a painting, making this algorithm, Fontana. It's just being able to look, I believe, with like a really open mind, and see what what needs what needs to be done, and act from act from that intuition. Yeah, but what's, it's the same challenge. What's your it's relation between physical and digital in terms of artwork output? I, uh, oh, so, uh, what do I prefer in terms of no, ways? What, what, what? How do you leave the two? In terms of practice making yeah, it. Yeah. Um, well. So with painting, obviously, like I think there's you know, like randomness. For instance, it's there. It just happens at the end of the paintbrush, or it happens mm. like when your mind. It happens in the body because mm. you're you 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 know you're using your body. Obviously, when you're writing code, you're not. It's not embodied in that way. Mm. Um, but it feels very similar to me. Once you get really familiar with coding, you don't. You know, you're not so. There's problem solving there, but it just feels a lot more. Knowing how to stop, when to stop, for instance. I yeah, think. yeah, it's still it's still all the same problems of trying to make good art, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same. Like if I make a sculpture, I need a certain technical set of skills uh, and problem solving to, to to make it work. But you know, the approach is very similar. The, the approach is very similar. So the the only the difference, like to answer your question, is that it's just not embodied, maybe. But then, if I'm like a, a writer, right, I can be creative. Oh, we don't question that, or a mathematician, they're, they're creative. I have to ask an inter yeah. sorry, I have to ask no, an inter please. interrelated uh, mm. question that um, ties into both of what they asked, which is when you approach the parameters of the algorithm and also the the um, the formal aesthetic of the works, do you have a specific number of colors that you use, style of color that you use? I notice there's a lot of blue in the work. Mm. Blue also has Hindu symbolism. Is there 
particular parameters that determine the number of colors that appear in each of the tiles individually. Mm. And then secondarily, Black Dragon, why did you decide black? Because all the colors come together, or it's right. evil, or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so color, um, with my previous, uh, with the previous project, Fontana, was the first project I ever built this color algorithm. So it was generative color. So every output is different color. Right. Although we, you know, um, so if you think, the, w the way that works is um, you think about all possible colors in a three-dimensional space. You often see it represented on lines, kind of like a cylinder or so forth. Um, I'm kind of like in making a color algorithm, I'm kind of carving that space. I'm taking stuff away and I say, okay, the piece that remains, that's the space of color I want to use. And then you're trying to create cle clever ways to kind of like never get going through that space. So it picks colors along the way and puts in the work. So that's this, this project's also generative color. So every output, although there's similar colors, that every, every one is unique. Um, so there's no, there's no pr often in generative art, a lot of people will use preset color palettes. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I mean, that has an advantage because you right. give each one a name and then that, that feeds into the rarity. And so you can make one of them particularly rare. And then the, so in this case, all, all the colors that we see in all the works are all unique yeah, in, in terms yeah, of the, yeah, the chromatic yeah, spectrum. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that's worth mentioning as well. It's right. fascinating. Yeah, it's right. interesting. I didn't know that. I, I do that in all my projects. Nice. So it's I thought like, yeah. this blue and that blue, I mean, that's well, why I might paired be, them. It might be true. exactly the same. It's yeah. probably very, like each one will yeah. be slightly different. Yeah. But, um, mm. um, and then the black dragon, yeah, it's not so much because it's evil. Uh, I could have done white, I guess. Uh, Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Um, <laughs> no, it was just a way of, because it, I wanted a way to, to make this these 108 black dragons distinct from the series. Mm. So I reduced, you know, I had this particular color space. They're not, it's not a palette, it's a color space just to make it distinct. And I also wanted to kind of like, I wanted to, to feel like there was some trade off, like to, to go down that rarity route, you were going to give something up, you're going to give up the palettes and you're going to get this. And this, I still want them to look beautiful, but. There had to be some trade-off. So mm. the, the black, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe there's a subconscious thing there. If people are going for, for statistical rarity, somehow they're evil. Interesting. Maybe it's a little dark. I don't know. Or maybe maybe. because the combination of color makes black. That's what right. I said. Right. Mm. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. This lady had one more question. So we're gonna. Did you have? Did you want to ask your question still? Sorry, I, yes, you had I it. Or, yes, please. Uh, it was also very nice that like the last answer became a discussion because I'm not so sure if this is like a question to you, but maybe to all of you. Uh, because I have been thinking about this fluxes thing since you mentioned it, and I'm, it, I really had uh, much difficulty at first kind of uh, trying to put these two things together. Uh, but then I thought, okay, well, uh, in terms of symbolic capital, yes, uh, uh, like this is a very niche thing, and fluxes was as well. Like um, people have to have technical um, competence, and also, but I would want to talk about the elephant in the room like the, these kinds of practices are much more uh, connected to economic capital as well which wasn't the case with fluxes as, at all. It was the antithesis yeah. Yes yeah. exactly yeah. so yeah. I would want to um, if you could just address that. Okay, so On yeah, so <laughs> I sounds like a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. so, so, so the way I think about it I, I don't know I like to apply sort of deep metaphoric labels to my thinking, which is probably to the detriment of how I write about art or how I think about things. Mm -hmm. There is art one. Art one is the physical painting. You have a painting, it's a self-contained entity. Art two could be conceived of, let's say, a generated algorithm where, I don't know, William Mopp and Tyler Hobbs, to use some Web3 examples, where you choose a generated algorithm, that's mint, that's the final product. Art three is this, where you have the original parameters, then you have the uh, generated potential outputs, and then you have the final configuration being orchestrated by the end user. So that's what, that's what to me is so exciting, is that it stretches the parameters and boundaries of what art can be in a way that I've never really seen before. Fluxus did the same, because in the 1950s, 60s, the idea of anyone being an artist, or art becoming into a life, or art becoming life, or 
uh, ice cubes becoming a way to melt and become art, or making a salad like Alison Knowles did, or deconstructing a flute like um, uh, George Brecht did. These or cut piece where people cut Yoko Ono's dress off. These were all performances that had a self-contained set of parameters. The instructions took place, the documentation took place, that was the entire artwork. Mm -hmm. This is the natural progression of Fluxus, where the parameters take place, but the artwork has actually no finite qualities because basically this project could go on forever. If the 108 black dragons are never discovered, then this is the artwork that, that operates for the rest of mankind. So I see this as a progression that has comparable elements to Fluxus as a movement, and that's how I anchor my thinking about this work in terms of its evolution and, and progression as an art object. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's, yeah, the, also art as it related to, as Fluxus had it, was totally anti-museum, totally anti-capitalistic, mm -hmm. totally outside the nexus that's of the fine art realm. Mm. Yeah, but you could also make the argument that a lot of the NFT world, the yeah. Web3, is also totally out of the fine art realm and totally different and separated as well. So the economic scarcity and the, and the conversations about value and rarity and the final, the secondary market and the fact that Harvey's cognizant of all of these things yeah. is, to me, a very interesting evolution in, in the art world, which is different than the normal economics of art, where everybody knows that this work is going to a museum and this work is, you know, you can't get the priceless because you're not important enough. I actually admire that there's a level of transparency, yeah. interoperability, and participation within this particular project that actually, in a sense, goes beyond the traditional, typical values of the art world and enters into a new phase, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, the copyright and as well elements. That too, yeah, it's yes. an added you know, It doesn't, it doesn't exist in the art world, you know, the legacy art. Right. So and it doesn't, ex it doesn't depend on any external funding or patrons. And like, these are the, a lot of things we don't talk about in the art world. Like a lot of these artists who were doing quite avant-garde projects had really strong patrons. And there was always an economic system supporting these people. Otherwise, they couldn't see them through. So I think we often don't talk about it, and it's quite romanticized. But I think this is actually, uh, as Nico was saying, a very transparent way. It's, it's completely run by the artist. It's actually, um, yeah, it's very, you know, it's not depending on any other institutions, any other commercial um, entities. It's only something that he's doing between him and his collector. And on that note, I would like to thank you all for being here this evening. It's been so lovely having you all here. Thank you so much, Harvey, for being thank here. You. Thank you to also a huge thank you to my amazing curators, Nico and Alfredo. It's been a delight being with you. And have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thanks so much for coming tonight. That's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>